Can Apple's M1 Max powerhouse give the MacBook Pro a shot in the arm? Can Google's Pixel 6 win the smartphone battle royal? And why does Samsung now sell 49 versions of the same smartphone? Vertical Hold is proudly brought to you by Aussie Broadband. Changing the game with their award-winning network and Australian-based support. Hey there, welcome back to Vertical Hold, Behind the Tech News. The tech podcast where we sneak across the state borders each week to catch up with Australia's leading technology journalists. Are we still sneaking across the borders or are they open? I've lost track. I think, I think, might I, I think we I'm sneak. in Queensland, so everybody sneaks across the bloody <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Have, that's, that's so true. We have that's to sneak so back in time to talk to Jen. <laughs> yeah, well, I, we're turning back dogs at this point. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm Adam Turner, and it's one of those weeks where too much tech is barely enough. And I'm joined, as always, by rampaging Alex Kidman. But I don't want to talk about Apple. I don't want to talk about Google. I don't even want to talk about Samsung at this point. Alex, the big question on everyone's lips is, why the hell is Facebook changing its name and what should it call itself? Look, I, I'm astonished that people are finding this so hard to work out when it is so, so clearly obvious that the only name that Facebook should change its corporate identity name to is Marky Z's House of Horrors. It's descriptive. It's accurate. Everyone will know what you're talking about. It's there. True. So I personally think they should take on the Tinder market and call it Zuck Buddies. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> no. no. Again, Marky Z's House of Horrors, and I think you just proved why. Yes, I think I did. So also joining us again, as we heard earlier in the virtual vertical hole studio this week, is longtime friend of the show and News Corp National Tech Editor, Jen Dudley-Nicholson. Jen, welcome back to the show. What should Facebook call itself? Well, first of all, I'm horrified. Um, and secondly, I was, I was thinking maybe face space. So we could bring back a little bit of MySpace, you know, the, the good old days. We could add some um, automatically playing music that the kids really don't yeah. realise that they're going to get into and then add a little bit of, you know, face in there as well. I think, yeah, I've nailed it. So first cab off the rank in the big tech player scene this week was Apple with its new MacBook Pros and insanely powerful M1 Pro and M1 Max chips. But before we dive into that with Jen, we caught up with Android expert Dan Tyson from EFTM to chat all things Pixel with the unveiling of the long-awaited Google Pixel 6 and 6 Pro. Dan, welcome back to the Vertical Hold Studios. Oh, look, guys, uh, great to be back in the studios, uh, remotely and covered in masks, of course, but... <laughs> What's yeah, good to be back. Is, and... <laughs> <laughs> Adam, the mask goes on you, not on the microphone. Oh, okay, that explains a lot. Yeah, it does. It does. Speaking of explaining things, given it is the topic of the week, Dan, apparently Facebook is looking for a new name. What do you reckon they should go with? Look, I'm terrible, so my immediate thought is bookface. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is why I'm not in marketing. <laughs> Facebook McFacebook. <laughs> That's the public vote. That's that the, public the public vote. <laughs> and speaking of the public, from this week, from right now when people are listening to this, they can actually formally and officially see and order the Google Pixel 6 and Pixel 6 Pro. Now, Dan, we had you on the show a couple of weeks ago to kind of talk Pixel as it was then. Google's now taken, you know, taken the formal wraps off. We sort of knew a lot about the Pixel 6 and Pixel 6 Pro, but can you give like a quick summary for people playing along at home as to what they are? Well, it's actually their first attempt officially on the record of being a flagship phone. I mean, we're six generations into the, the Pixel the prior line. The Pixels were just junk? Yeah. Apparently so. Uh, they've now taken great pains to call them a flagship for the Pixel 6 Pro and a premium tier device for the Pixel 6. So we've got two brand new phones going for it with Google's everything that they can possibly be, in, including the kitchen sink of their own tensor processing unit. So they're throwing everything at it. They're throwing a camera bar which looks insane on the back of this phone, which actually has all the specs that you could possibly want out of a camera. They've got premium materials. They've got their own silicon. They've got big, bright displays on the front. What can go wrong? 
So have they gone above and beyond? Is this the mother of all smartphones or are they just doing what they need to do to keep up? At this stage, I think they're really just throwing everything hardware-wise against the wall to really catch up to the likes of Samsung and Apple in terms of the premium look and feel of a device. I mean, that's basically what we're seeing here. I mean, we've seen the Pixel 5 last year was just a very mid-range attempt. And it did pretty well, actually. But they've never really... Like, Google's never been really taken seriously in the smartphone market. I mean, they never advertise. They never do any of the, the actual groundwork for the carriers or the telcos. That's apparently what they're promising this year. So we're going to be seeing the deals coming out. We're going to be seeing all the the partnerships come up. And that's really what's needed to make a phone successful these days. So I'm I'm looking forward to seeing the big bash of uh, marketing coming out there, including, I I don't know if you guys uh, watch much free-to-air TV, including an ad which aired before the announcement of the Pixel 6, which told us the price, the date. And where you can get it from. So, so Google on with there. that uh, marketing there. <laughs> yeah, Google certainly said a lot about this phone before it launched. Um, and you mentioned the tensorship, which sort of puts them in that Apple territory of we own the operating system, we design the chips ourselves. What's special about Tensor, though? Well, why, why is it going to be, or why does Google reckon it's going to be better than your, your high-end Snapdragons or Exynoses or, or similar? Well, I think this year might be their, their their initial foray into the CPU market, so it might be a, a, a just a, a an nice intro, one? just version one, just just settle down on your your likening to Apple and, <laughs> and the line there. Uh, but it it gives them the opportunity. I mean, Google is always talking about machine learning and AI models and things like this, and Tensor has always been their server side processes that they've used to actually power all this like AI stuff in the cloud that then goes down to your phone. And so what they're doing with Tensor is actually putting that into a mobile application processor that they can stick in your phone. So a lot of the features that they announced are actually happening on device and nothing to do with the cloud. It's faster. It's no, obviously, privacy issues with going out to the cloud to do stuff with your data. So that's basically what they're doing with Tensor. It gives them a lot more AI and ML um, power that they can do on the device. From their perspective, do you think it's more about the performance or it's more about the privacy uh, I think it's more about the performance. Um, Google does a lot with privacy. They, they, they're very careful when they're in their PR anyway um, <laughs> about talking about that. Um, so I think it's more about getting ML. Like, like Google is really run by engineers and you get that feeling when you talk to a few of the Googlers around. It's, it's really that sort of thing. So I reckon that they're very much being engineering driven by this easier access to all the, the, the bits and bobs on, on processes on the phone is, is really the driver for this one. Now, you can't have a premium phone without premium cameras. And again, we, we knew that the, the raw speeds and feeds, numbers and specs and so on for that side of things. But what they really announced this week, what they revealed was more software features in camera. Uh, anything particular take your eyes that you hadn't seen before? Oh, it's the seen before thing that really mm. trips you up because a lot of these features that they announce you have seen before. Like they, they introduced real tone, which um, is for more for people of color and representing true shades of kin skin tone, which there's been stabs at that in the past. And, and I'm obviously not a person of color, so I don't really have the option to take a picture of myself and judge that. So I've sort of got to do some work there. But things like the Magic Eraser, very cool feature, which rubs out something in the background or like people, cars, dogs and things like that. Uh, but it is things we've seen before um, in, in some iteration or another. But this is Google's spin on it. And Google's done pretty well with a lot of their, their camera features. I mean, the Pixel 1 release introduced us to a lot of really cool features. Then Pixel 2 bought the night sight, which really upped the ante in terms of low light photography. And then nothing for the last five or three years. <laughs> so this is like, the, I mean, they actually went down the track of actually using the same sensors on their, their Pixel phones for the last four years. I think mm. it was the Pixel 1 to Pixel 2 was a change. But yeah, they've used the same sensor. So this is massive. I mean, we're going from a 12 megapixel sensor up to a 50 megapixel sensor. The actual um, microns of the, the pixel size is larger, two and a half times larger. So potential there. I mean, Google did a fantastic job with the 12 megapixel sensor. I'm interested to see what they can do with a 50. It's really good to see them actually getting into this idea of, hey, if we have more lenses, we've got telephotos, wides, ultrawides, and so on, people can do more with their photography, whereas before it was always, oh, look, we can do all of that in software, so you only get you know, one, maybe two lenses. It's nice to see them 
really competing there. They are leading in some ways, though, because the 6 Pro is going to be the first of a, well, effectively a new breed of 5G phones here in Australia, isn't it? It's going to be, uh, (laughs) that's a long road ahead, Uh, it's going to be the first Australian phone with millimeter wave uh, 5G attached, which is basically a really high capacity download, so you get really fast downloads, but it's so narrow you have to be standing on that street corner, pointing your phone at the actual tower and hold it there for the five seconds it takes for your 40 gig file to download because it probably will download 40 gig very, very quickly. But you have to stand there exactly where it is in its current iteration. Yeah, Millimeter Wave is going to be super, super targeted. Uh, Telstra, I think, is talking of like two or three sites where it's actually live to the public. Yeah, they sent me an email the... about where I could test it, and I think they literally told me the street corner I had to stand on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but got... Just before we recorded this, actually, Optus put out a release about its own millimetre wave stuff, yeah. saying that they'd gotten higher speeds at Telstra, but they won't tell you where it is. Oh, that's uh, very useful. Didn't Telstra pull down... It's in down... the basement of headquarters. Was it 3.6 gig or something Telstra were bragging that they pulled down on it? Something like that. I think it was, yeah, 3.6 or 3.8. I yeah. Think it was easy. So that's, yeah. that's insane if you're in the right spot. Crazy. Yeah. Um, but uh, but Millimeter Wave will come. You're right. It's, it's future looking. Millimeter Wave will come. And it's going to be more of that kind of they'll install it in a stadium. They'll install it in a big city CBD. Mm, yeah. Not so much, you know, you, you, you're 50K outside of Wagga Wagga and suddenly the 5G <laughs> Millimeter Wave kicks in. That's not going to happen. Um, but it's still significant because they're the first to do it. Others have made millimeter wave capable phones. I mean, it still annoys me, and I know you're an Android guy, but it still annoys me that Apple has for two generations now had a millimeter wave capable iPhone, which it has not sold outside the US, which would have worked on Australian millimeter wave networks. But it's one of those frustrating things that you know the hardware's there. It's like um, ultra wideband and stuff like that that we're seeing on like the, the iPhone, which is just taking its sweet time to come to Android phones. So reverse is true. I mean, it's it's just one of those features that sort of will come into utility more in the in the coming years. And quite frankly, I don't personally see it as a as a big driver. I mean, I've still got a drive to get to an actual five G just a sub six tower. Where so so adding a millimeter wave into the mix, I literally have to drive to Sydney to get access to a millimeter wave tower. So absolutely useless for probably ninety five percent of Australians. It's it's just not going to be one of those features. It, but it is, as you said, it's it's one of those like windows into the future of coming stuff and and and, and it's a premium flagship phone. Yeah. I mean, you, if you're going to have a flagship phone in this day and age, where mid range phones, and Dan, I think you'd agree with me, a lot of the mid range Androids right now are really great phones. Mm. Again. Probably for like 90 to 95% of people, they'll do more than they ever need to do. So a flagship absolutely should be the supercar of the smartphone world. It should push those limits. Yeah, because they've even, like the the Pixel 6 Pro also gets like the Wi-Fi 6E support and stuff like that, which basically no one has a router out, but it's got it. It's it's ready to go when it comes here. And and that's cool. Like that's that's what a flagship to me is. It's got all the bits and bobs and, and, and little bits and pieces that when you go to use something and go... Oh, it's actually got it. Rather than oh, that's that's just the reaction I, I sort of have with a flagship. It's it's one of those things that it's got to have the kitchen sink. So going to the other extreme, though, are we going to see a Pixel Six A? Yeah. So the mid-range Pixels are really weird. So they released the Five A in I think August, uh, but only for the US and Japan. Um, so Japan is one of the major markets for Pixel. Um, outside the US and yeah so they're the only two getting it but I do get the feeling we may see a Pixel 5a eventually here even if it's in the dying stages of the product cycle so I'm sort of moving a little bit of mid-range stock because we really don't have anything except the Pixel 4a and that's only what stock is left in stores so mm. it's basic I mean it's basically sold out yeah absolutely Google's I mean, market now is the Pixel 6 and that's it yeah, I, I, that's a pretty high <laughs> target to hit. Well, you say high, but this is the other surprising thing. So we knew they were pushing into the premium space and the the 5 and the the 4A 5G were decidedly mid-range pricing and, and features and so on. Mm. But the pricing on these is pretty sharp for a flagship phone, especially compared to the likes of your Samsungs and Apples. 
like starting off the Pixel Six at nine ninety nine and the the Pro at twelve ninety nine is just crazy. And then you see some of the Telstra pre order pricing. Um, that's getting crazier again for like a flagship phone. There's having used it for only a couple of days. It's you'd be mad to get anything else at this stage. Like that's just everything that you could possibly want at this stage. The I mean, pre-order deals are really interesting because I think there's Optus, <laughs> Optus and Vodafone are giving you the the Pixel, Pixel buds, buds A, yeah. which are which are perfectly workable true wireless buds. Nothing wrong yep. with them. Uh, but uh, Google themselves if you buy it from them, it's I think like a hundred buck gift voucher for the six yeah. and one hundred and fifty for the six Pro. We slightly out on those store, numbers. Which yeah, to spend on the store, eight. not quite enough for a Pixel Buds A. <laughs> But it's you know it could but get you something. some accessories. It could get you towards a you know a, a, some other device. Well, given the cases are fifty dollars, and the if you do actually want a charger with your new Pixel, you'll have to pay the forty five dollars mm. for the thirty watt charger. That's true. There's, There's hundred bucks right there. <laughs> There's yeah. hundred bucks right there. Right there. Um, but then Telstra's basically said, yeah, look, no Pixel buds from us. Just two hundred bucks off the cost of any of two hundred big ones. And there, frankly, yeah. I'd be lapping that up if like. In a heartbeat. That's that's the deal I'd be going for. I mean, you'd, well, personally, <laughs> I, I, I haven't checked the fine detail here, and I know at least one Telstra rep who does listen to the show, but uh, I suspect it's actually only 150 once you equate it out. Yeah. Because you've got to get it on a plan, and if exactly. you got it with their cheapest plan and paid it out straight away, mm. but you'd also get a, a month's worth of phone service. So, you know, exactly not, right. It's not so bad. The other thing, in theory, you could spend that, well, at least 150 buck voucher if you've got the 6 Pro on. Would be the Pixel Stand, but not yet. <laughs> and what's the Pixel Stand, and why can't I have one yet? So, according to Google, they are still putting the finishing touches on the Pixel Stand, and we'll find out more about it later this year. Um, but it's a wireless charger uh, for your Pixel or Pixel 6 Pro. It can offer up to 23 watts of wireless charging. It says up to 23 watts because, according to some of the leaks, the Pixel 6 will charge at 21 watts, while the Pixel 6 Pro gets 23 watts. <laughs> Don't know why, but hey, that's their phone and their engineering. I don't know that side. Um, but yeah, basically a wireless uh, charging stand for your Pixel phone, which will actually put it also into a software mode, uh, which has a dashboard for things like your Nest Cams and now playing and even just an alarm clock for when you're going to bed. So it's a, it's a utilitarian sort of thing, but uh, I actually started using my Pixel stand more at work, um, just on the desk. And it was actually quite good because it had like a nice little um, dashboard that gave you a lot of information. And frankly, with the Pixel Stand 2, I'm interested because it actually adds in another feature, which I really missed out of the first gen, which was a fan. Because uh, my Pixel got very hot when you charge it all day on wireless charging. So the Pixel Stand Gen 2 gets a fan. So we get a little bit of cooling there. And yeah, we're just going to have to wait and see for that one. So, so I $119 think answer- later in the year. I think you answered my question. There. I was going to say, don't we already have the Pixel Stand? I swear I've got one in a box somewhere. But oh, we do. What we're that's, waiting for. That's yeah. That's the original one. This is the new. Can you still get up the original one? one? Yeah, you can still use the original okay, one. Okay, so I, this I, is the I second generation right one with more yeah. bells and whistles. Yeah, so I thought I was going crazy. I'm like, I swear, I don't know if, if you give me a minute, I can find it. One. It's in a box somewhere. I don't think he can anymore. They oh, okay. were selling it up until yesterday. Um, ah, all right. But yeah, it's now hmm. been replaced on the store. Yeah. But. Yeah, the, the first one was only 10 watt charging, so this is effectively ah, double yeah. the charging speed, all that sort of stuff, the fan in there. Yeah. And it's got, it's got. I think it's, if I remember the spec sheet correctly, it's also got kind of variable charging, so you can have like full speed fan, you know, more power, Scotty, to the engines kind of stuff. Or if Pretty it's going much. to annoy you in a phone call, or it, while you're sitting there at work, it'll charge slower but quieter and things like that. A That's few it. smart little very googly bits. It's it's always got a little bit of some pizzas in there, but uh, yeah, I just can't wait to get a hands on one. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, they just didn't have it ready for launch, which is disappointing. But totally Google. Well, that gives us an excellent overview of the Pixel Six, and now Dan, it's time for you once again to face the classic vertical hold questions of doom. Oh God! All three at once. Where can people find your work online? Where can they find you on social media? And the current contentious question du jour what's the best australian bird okay find all my work at eftm.com you'll find me on social media at frog hollow which is frog hollow with a ph and the best australian bird i have voted for the laughing kookaburra so let's go how very traditional thanks for joining us dan (laughs) a pleasure as always
So, Jen, it was once again time to load up on the coffee, load up on the caffeinated gummy bears, get up early, early, early in the morning because Apple had new products to show off. And the star of the show, as was expected, were a whole bunch of MacBook Pro upgrades. Anything particular caught your eye in the bright, shiny world of new MacBook Pros? Yeah, well, these look like um, some properly powerful beasts. And I, I think that people have been waiting to see, you know, what the next generation Apple Silicon was going to be like. Um, you know, we've been, the first one delivered lots of battery. We were waiting for lots of power to come with these. Um, and it looks like they will not just burn a hole in your pocket, but they actually require two wholly redesigned fans in order to not burn an actual hole in your pocket. Um, these could be potentially, you know, quite beastly when they come out. I mean, according to Apple, and I haven't had a play with one, um, according to Apple, we're talking about up to, with the Max, um, like a, a 13 times, uh, you know, sort of graphic speed and up, not quite four times the amount of CPU power. That seems like a lot. Um, I haven't entirely managed to break the M1 processor, although a few times I've made it pause and, and have a think about its life. Um, so yeah, potentially these are, are going to be beastly for people who really need all the streams of, of 8K footage put into, you know, an easily digestible thing they can add to YouTube. So would you say that the M1 Pro is for us mortals and the M1 Max is for basically high-end professionals? It does seem like that. And it's certainly priced like that as well. Mm. Um, because if you look at them, so, I mean, you can, you can get into the market for around that three grand price, which is definitely kind of high end laptop space. But then if you start adding things and including that, that M1 max chip, uh, then, and you add like, I mean, admittedly eight terabytes of storage, sure. Nine grand on a computer. Let's go. I think that's probably not in the mortal range. It's an awful, it's an awfully good deal though, if you're in that professional space range though i mean nine grand for a very powerful video editing rig to a lot of businesses actually isn't all that much in terms of what it could theoretically do um and i suppose we should very quickly backtrack and just point out what we're talking about here with the m1 pro and the m1 max are two different chips there's a lot more differentiation in those lines whereas all the m1 imax and macbook airs and mac minis to date have all been basically the same chip. This is quite a differentiated kind of line of genuinely pro products. Yeah, even the difference between um, sort of the, the M1 Pro and the M1 Max is quite substantial. Um, like you see the size of them put together is that you know, one is much larger than the other and has uh, like 20 billion more, um, you know, transistors on it. So yeah, this is this is potentially a very powerful beast, and I mean, as you say, it, it could definitely work out if you were um, in that space. And you know, previously we've seen like the, I believe it's the Mac Pro, which um, was an amazing shape, but only was really purchased by professionals, and it was also an amazing price. Um, I thought one of the interesting things with this one too is that they brought back heaps of connections. Because these devices, All the ports. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, so excited exactly. about this, yeah. and that that says an awful lot about why I don't have friends. But, uh, <laughs> I'm so excited by the fact that this is a MacBook Pro with actual Pro ports on the thing. You can actually plug things into this computer. What a revelation! Um, and to give Apple credit where it, it probably deserves it, like the company has taken away things before um, and has been the first to do so and has copped a lot of flack for it. And ultimately it's worked out. We don't see that many CD ROMs on the front of magazines anymore. And that's probably a good thing. Um, but it's nice to be able to plug lots of things into a professional computer like that, especially one where you're not really wanting it to be the thinnest device in the world. Like these are about one and a half centimeters, 1.6 centimeters thick. Um, and so it makes sense that you can put a camera SD card right into the side of it, that you can plug in an extra monitor because you're probably going to do that at home if you're editing video and what have you, or dare I say, actually in a workspace. Um, and we saw the MagSafe um, charger come back too, which I thought was, was interesting because I thought that it was gone. But there you go. It's back. And it's it's a weird one as well, if, I, if I'm reading the specs correctly, because they introduced... Uh, everyone expected a 16-inch MacBook Pro, and mm -hmm. there is a new 16-inch MacBook Pro, but there's also the 14-inch variant. And if I'm reading the specs correctly, from what I've read, the 14-inch one, MagSafe or USB-C, as the current Pros and Airs and so on do, but the 16 is MagSafe 
only, which, I mean, I guess the 16's not quite as portable. Maybe that's not quite as much of a problem. But I sort of don't want to have to take around a MagSafe charger with me all the time. If that's the only way I can do it, it feels limiting to me. Is that just me? No, I, I kind of understand that. And it's kind of back to the old days where, you know, if you didn't have your charger at the airport, then you'd have to scrounge around and, and hope that somebody else had one, for example. Um, and it will require you to take around one of those like blocks with you too, because this is not just, you know, one long cord. This will have a power brick attached to it, I'm assuming. It does mean, though, that they'll have to include it in the box, I'm assuming. Never assume anything. <laughs> not when it comes to Apple. And speaking of assumptions, um, Apple spent so many years telling us how wonderful the touch bar was. And then and then the choirs, of, as far as I'm concerned, the choirs of angels descended and there was a hallelujah from on high because it's gone from the pro line, which presumably means it's gone. Jen, will you be pouring one out for the touch bar? I will. I like the touch bar. Oh, I'm, so I'm... you were the one. I was the one they made you. it for. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be sticking with the M1. No, um, look, I know that there were a lot of feelings that people had apparently about the touch bar. I liked the contextual like basis of it where, you know, things would pop up and you would occasionally see something useful on it and be able to tap on it, just like, you know, when occasionally autocorrect gets it right. Um, but yeah, apparently people regarded the touch bar as if it was clippy and now at least in the pro line, it is dead. I still have hopes that, you know, if they bring out, um, more sort of mini pros, I guess, and, and, you know, the, the, the next version of the air, it will live on, but we don't know. The touch bar is potentially endangered. I really reckon that the stars are in alignment when it comes to the MacBook Pro, because I've. As I'm recording on a 2012 MacBook Pro that has needed to be replaced for a while, but that every... whizzing sound you can hear is not Adam. <laughs> it's my MacBook Pro. Good. But every year the new MacBook Pros would come along. There'd be something I hated about them: the crappy butterfly keyboard thing, the touch mm. bar, the the lack of connectors, the the loss of the MagSafe connector. There was always something that was really frustrating that I would miss compared to the one that I had. And a lot of people actually, this 2012 model is the last of before they made all those changes. And a lot of people really wish they'd just take one of these and put the new guts in it. But we sort of seem to be, they've, they've wound back a few things. They've returned a few things just in time for the M1 as well. I think if like me, you've been hanging out and every year there was something wrong with the MacBook lineup, this might be the year that you go, yeah, all right, it's not cheap, but it's time to drop some money on a new MacBook Pro. And it does say something about Apple that they've clearly listened to a lot of the feedback. Like they mm. did listen when there were issues with the keyboard. I think they kind of had to. Eventually. They, eventually, they, what, eventually. three models in or whatever, yeah. And look, we, they, they took out a lot of these ports back in 2016 when the MacBook Pro came out then. And so to have them back now is quite a big, you know, ego blast potentially for a, for a company to kind of accept and they have and i think they'll be rewarded that by printing some more money mm. they'll be printing a lot of money i mean i was doing some checking and checking on prices and so on before we recorded and for those baseline models if you don't want a lot of over specification and you don't have nine grand to drop on them they're sold out because they theoretically come available and i think it's the 26th of october off the top of my head but they're actually effectively sold out for about a month. If you ordered one literally as we're recording this, you wouldn't get it till late November at best. So clearly a lot of pros are buying. They are upgrading. Well, either that or Apple has the same chip constraints as everyone else and they only actually have three to sell. I suspect that they're doing okay in terms of chips. I reckon that they've got probably one of the better supply chains available. And I've talked to a lot of people who've seen that and like right after the event had had considered ordered one and you know gone through the process and trying to work out what flavor they wanted um but then are now deciding to go into a store so with so many freedom times around the place then potentially i don't know if we'll see a queue anymore but i think that we could see a lot more people in stores having a look for these devices and trying to get them as soon as they can speaking of a license to print money is it just me or is the difference the only difference between the 500 um 512 gig model and the one terabyte model, the hard drives, yet the price goes up by $300. So to go up to double the size of the hard drive, I pay $300 when I could buy a one terabyte hard drive retail for $100. Mm. 
or are there other changes to that model that I'm missing? There Could- probably aren't, but there's two things to bear in mind there. One is that this is an entirely integrated unit, and it's worth keeping that in mind for stuff like RAM as well. You can't upgrade the RAM. Either. Can you upgrade the hard drive? No, no. The Ooh. whole thing is just one So they've got you by the block. balls. You've got no choice. Because I was no, no, thinking no, no. Well, maybe up- I'll save okay. my money. You can upgrade the hard drive in the sense that you can plug in an external hard drive. But you but can't you replace certainly can't. The You can't pop it open and, and you know, pop it. Because I chip was in actually there. thinking I've got a spare terabyte That's hard been the story. drive. Maybe I'll save my 300 bucks. You've, no, no. You've had your, your 2012 model for way, way too long. <laughs> way, way That's too long. You've saved your money. quite some time now. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, but the other part of the equation, and this has been true even, even from 2012, is Apple has always charged too much for storage. Yeah. They always, always overcharge for, on, for onboard storage. Even Just the M1 mean. MacBook Air to go from 256 to 512 gig, 300 bucks. That's just outrageous. I've, I've seen similar prices when you talk about like the iPhone 13 and, and going up in, in size, um, yeah, in, in storage size through yeah. those models as well. It is costly. Yeah. How much um, do you want to store your stuff? And, and, and again, for, this pro, for that pro video editing market, they will pay that premium. Because the difference in workflow speed, the difference in bandwidth across having an external drive or having yeah, something yeah. that is churning internal is means the world to them. For sure. So Apple knows it can charge this kind of stuff. Um, although, on the other side of the equation, we also got new wish AirPods. Jen, should I be excited by the uh, AirPods 3? Well, yes and, and, and maybe. Uh, so I think Apple made a smart decision because obviously a lot of people are using earbuds um, at the moment to kind of walk around their house and pretend that they're working when they're actually, you know, putting the washing on. Um, and so these ones are, are particularly good because even though they're high-end models and they've got some nice extra features, uh, they're also not ones that absolutely block out all noise just uh, by isolating it and kind of having caps that kind of stick in your ear. Some people don't like those. Um, I'm keen to test these out because they look like they've got a bit of a different shape to the head of them. And I'm hoping that um, Apple, like, and this doesn't, this isn't weird. It sounds weird, but that Apple has a wall of plastic ears that they're checking these all with. I've seen these from other companies like Jabra and the like, where they, they actually can test, you know, what sticks in, in most people's ears. And I hope maybe they do that without, um, yeah, actually harming any any of those. I can ears. see Anthony Hopkins being in charge of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking more of like a Rocky thing, but yeah, um, <laughs> I think apart from the weirdest thing, I mean, they are smaller. They are, you know, they've got spatial audio. They're not as expensive as the the top model wireless earbuds at the moment. I'm keen to to give them a test, particularly because my original um, Apple AirPods that I like so much. One of them has died. Is noise cancelling the only thing that's missing from these compared to the more expensive AirPods Pro? Noise cancellation and uh, and also noise noise isolation. Oh, and so no- noise isolation is the rubber tip things. Yes. And noise cancellation is the actual software filtering out the sound. Exactly, yes. Cool. And so you won't get that with these, but I think some people don't require that necessarily yeah. with their earbuds. Although the, the rubber tips thing is an important point because it also, it's not just the isolation, there's also a layer of comfort to that. I'm someone who finds regular AirPods a little bit uncomfortable after a while, whereas I can wear the AirPods Pro, and my AirPods Pro have survived a trip through my washing machine, so I consider them immortal by now. No. Uh, I, can, I can wear those, you know, till the battery runs out. See, I, I find the opposite. Like after just wearing... No, not just Apple varieties, but um, but all kinds of like noise isolation things. After a while, I feel like my equilibrium gets a bit off, and I'm I'm hearing things incorrectly and stuff, and and I need some some air in my ears or something. And that's so the, for people like myself, then this is another option. That's what the big ones do to me. The big mm-hmm. um, over the ear cans, like the Pro Maxes and the Sony ones, whatever. While they're fantastic, sometimes they're a bit too good and it's almost like the pressure pops in your ears and it really is quite disorientating i think the other thing there and i'm i haven't got ears on with them so i don't know and i do want to test them but that market has moved so fast with so many other players cheaper than these third gen airpods with many of the same features and in some cases more you can get noise cancelling not great but you can get noise cancelling style buds of that type from other brands now so I think Apple's got a bit of a fight ahead of itself. Now, part of that fight was something genuinely kind of surprising that they announced, 
the Apple Music Voice Plan. This is a, for those who are not aware, this is a much cheaper version of Apple Music, still the full catalog, but you have to talk to Siri. It is only voice activated. Jen, are you, are you happy with this idea of, a, of pay, giving Apple less money, but having to scream to people on the bus, no, I want to play that song, you <laughs> stupid voice assistant? Everyone's going to hear about my music. No, um, I, th- I think it's a really interesting idea. And like, I, I think this is one of the ones that wasn't rumored. So, so that made it even more interesting. Um, but I felt, I thought of it as more of a play for sort of getting people getting Apple music for the first time, if they've got Siri speakers. So if you've got, you know, potentially a whole bunch of, you know, home pods around your house, you know, they're 150 bucks. So it makes sense. You can't use those with a lot of the music services that are out there, or it's very difficult to do so. I haven't worked it out yet. Um, so potentially, you know, if you, you do have that situation, then you can ask for more things, um, yeah, from your home pods. As for asking from your phone, it makes sense in certain situations, but other times it's just going to be awkward, whether you're wearing AirPods or not. <laughs> and there's some other high-end features that you miss out on as well, isn't there? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's it's very difficult to kind of create your own playlists, for example, um, when you're just speaking to Siri about them. So it, I think it re- will rely a lot more on that sort of music matching artificial intelligence and this is what we think you want to hear type stuff, yeah. um, which I think all of the smart speakers rely on a little bit because a lot of them, you know, you ask for one song and it starts playing something random afterwards and freaks out my kid. <laughs> But there's also, I think you miss out on spatial audio and lossless audio and all those sort of high end, you know, turn your head and the audio moves with you kind of thing. And offline playback, I thought was a bit harsh as well. You can't actually save stuff on your phone or whatever to listen to while you're out going for a walk. Um, That's a real surprise. Is that because there's no way to manage that by voice? You can't say, hey, what's your face? Make it up. There's, there's. I've got no doubt. They could manage that. They could do they it, They don't yeah. want to. They, that, that, that is a feature that you pay for full that's, Apple Music. That's a bit harsh, I think. That one, I reckon they should have been able to squeeze into this. Uh, this, it, this is a cut price plan, though, and it is it is pretty inexpensive. If you want to go less expensive, you can you know, do the Spotify th- uh, free thing and then just listen to ads. But I don't think that Apple is, is really going to introduce ads to its music service. Mm. Um, and you mentioned the HomePod Mini. Uh, it's now got a new hat. Because there's new colours coming. Uh, is that something that uh, excites you, Jenny? Are you keen for a, you know, a bright yellow HomePod Mini? Oh, look, I think it's attractive. But although I saw the orange one because they, they were making a big deal about the orange one. And honestly, I thought it was Halloween themed, but it's not going to be out in time for <laughs> Halloween. So I'm a little bit disappointed. You could paint the rest of the pumpkin on it and leave it till next year. Uh, what a hope sure. It working. I'm not that committed to Halloween all year round, to be honest. Uh, I mean, it was it's a nice to have, and I think the HomePod Mini is a smart device because it's it's kind of correctly priced now, um, yeah, for for Apple users and and potential Apple users and people who haven't tried that sort of thing before. It brings it down into like the the Google and Alexa kind of range of of products. Um, as for whether it'll sell more because it's blue, I mean, maybe. But Maybe we're to stylish ign- people. But we're ignoring the most important product of the launch and the one that I know that has Adam the most excited. Adam, I know you've been waiting to buy your new MacBook Pro, <laughs> but clearly there's an accessory that you need with it. Tell there us is. all about it. I must absolutely have the $29 magic cloth for cleaning the screen, the Apple endorsed one. So it was the magical one. I think it was, you know, touched and blessed by Steve Jobs back in the day and they've cut it up into little pieces and they're selling it off almost like memorabilia. $29 for the cloth that the optometrist gives you for free when you buy a pair of glasses. I'll take three. I would just like to point out that, yes, you're you're mocking it and you're mocking it well, good sir. Thank you. However... There's a 10-week wait on that stuff. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to (laughs) say. Apple (laughs) does market beautifully. It does. does. It's printing more money as we speak because this thing is sold out. So apparently I have been buying cheap cloths my entire life or just getting them for free or using tissues when I shouldn't have. Um, Maybe I need to pay more for tissues. I don't know. Do you think when we get back to those cheap Shanghai knockoff markets, they'll have the fake Apple cloth <laughs> and Apple will be spelt with like one P and two L's or something? They will smell terrible, but they'll yeah. be so much cheaper. Yes. Well, 
Apple was not the only one to have a launch this week. Obviously, we've already talked Pixel, but Samsung decided to pull the Galaxy Unpacked badge out for an early morning launch. But Jen, this one was genuinely different. And in a way that some people may not have appreciated quite as much as others. What did Samsung actually have to show off in the early hours of the morning? Colours. The movie? That's it. That's it. No, just just colours. No. Just, so uh, there, there weren't a lot of rumours around this particular event, which is strange because, you know, obviously before the Google event, I mean, there'd been leaks for actual months. And before the Apple event, we basically had a rough idea of what was going on there as much as you can do. With the Samsung, we hadn't really heard that much, and it turns out because there wasn't that much to be heard. Um, so, yes, they're, they're going to introduce uh, different colored panels. I believe that they come in five different colors, and you can uh, come. This is there's for also... the Galaxy Z Flip 3, to be specific. They're little, exactly. They're little yep. which, which makes sense for that particular phone because it's very much targeted at kind of like an influencer market. According to uh, the event last night, it's um, it's targeted at uh, very adorable Korean women who sing music um, and uh, and like very cute dogs um, or cats, as the case may be. And they did a new hat for their phone. <laughs> exactly, and so this is this is sort of different colored panels and also different colored frames. Apparently, you could make forty nine different color combinations should you really want to. Um, but after it does take a while. So if you want to order them with one of these custom designs, then I think it takes uh, an extra five weeks from, mm. from memory, um, which seems like a, a long time to wait for your brand new phone. Uh, it's it's an interesting strategy. It's just one that I was a bit disappointed that I stayed up so late to watch after a really big week of tech. <laughs> it's also a more expensive strategy because the, the custom ones are, I think it's uh, about 180 bucks over the top of the price of the regular Z Flip 3, which is still in that premium price territory, is $1,600, $1,700. Again, off the top of my head. Yeah, it, it is expensive. I mean, it, they, they would look very attractive, but I'm not saying they won't. And it, it's potentially a strategy to make you stay with that model for longer, given that you've personalized it yourself as well. Um, and it's a model that's worked well in handbags, so potentially it can work in phones as well. Um, but I'm not sure if anyone who buys into it has ever heard of a thing called a case because you could buy a case for your phone for much less money and you can take it off and then put another case on as well. Okay, so I will defend Samsung in two respects here, Mm -hmm. and one of them is going to make Adam very, very happy. Um, The first thing I'll say is you're right about the case, and I'm a big, big case fan. I think people should generally put cases on all phones, but it is harder with a foldable phone to get a case that will properly protect and so on and do the things that I want a case to do. But also, given that fashion focus for the Z Flip 3, when they launched it, they launched it here with seven different colours, which was kind of exceptional in itself. Most phones you're lucky to get, like, three colour choices, if that. Seven was pretty good. This adds another 49. And and here's where Adam's going to get happy because I'm going to invoke the three holy words he loves the most. Supply chain management. Oh, I thought you were going to say Korean fried chicken, but yes, supply chain management <laughs> is in there as well. Uh, we, we can launch a separate podcast about the supply <laughs> chain management of Korean fried chicken another day, Adam. But the, but what impresses me with this is, yeah, you got this five to six week wait, but then they're going to have to su- supply warranty support and they're going to have to ship these all over the planet. I'm impressed with the process. I'm impressed with the fact that they're saying, yes, you can do this because... In the same breath, you look at, say, Microsoft, for example, they'd launched their whole new Surface range a few weeks ago. And there they say, right, well, if you want it with this specification, no, we only do that one in black. We only do that one in blue. You are stuck with these choice lanes. The, um, The new MacBook Pros we were just talking about, if you want more than 32 gig, you have to get the M1 Max. The M1 Pro doesn't do more than 32 gig. Everywhere you look, there's these limitations on what you can do. And Samsung's basically said, hey, look, you want colors, you want choice, you want style, have it. I think in that sense alone, that's impressive. And perhaps brave, (laughs) considering what's happening in the world at the moment. Well, that just about wraps up another bumper episode of Vertical Hold. Thanks to Jen for joining us for this week's show. Absolute pleasure. And Jen, you're an old hand on the show. You know what's coming. The Vertical Hold, Three Questions of Doom. Where can people find your work online? 
Where can they find you on social media? And the current big contentious question, what's the best Australian bird? The best Australian bird? Okay, I'll come back to that. So you can find me on Twitter at Jen Dudley because I'm pretty much always there. And you can find a lot of my work across all of the News Corp mastheads like the Daily Telegraph and the Courier Mail and the Herald Sun. And the best bird, I've actually got um, some tawny frogmouths uh, that live near me and they're adorable and they have a little fluffy baby and I love them. So that is the best bird. That is an amazing choice. The Muppet of Australian birds. <laughs> exactly. It's, 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 it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. And speaking of gorgeous, thanks also to Dan for making time earlier to chat to us. And as always, you can catch us online at Vertical Hold AU on Twitter via the Vertical Hold Facebook, or should I say the Vertical Hold Mighty Z's House of Horror page, <laughs> and at verticalhold.com.au on the web. And thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. Don't forget to tell your friends about us. Leave us a review on your podcasting platform of choice and help us spread the good word. Vertical Hold is proudly brought to you by Aussie Broadband, changing the game with their award-winning network and Australian-based support. Sorry, brain's going. What's Johnny Tim Hood. Yeah. Tim Cook. It's, it's, the, it's Tim Apple. It's the magical one. I think it was part of the shroud that they put over Steve Jobs <laughs> and they've cut it up into little pieces to sell it off. We all get complaints no, about okay, that one. With it, all right. <laughs>